Hello and welcome to The Right Idea, where we discuss the people, policy, and politics that drive Texas. I'm your co-host, Brian Phillips. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. With me, as always, is our co-host, Derek Cohen, our Vice President of Policy at TPPF. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Mandy Drogan. Mandy is the Campaign Director for TPPF's Next Generation Campaign uh, and one of Texas and the nation's most uh, effective advocates for parental empowerment and school choice. Welcome to the show, Mandy. Thank you for having me. Well, Derek, this is it. This is officially. It only took us thirty shows, <laughs> but we finally have the school choice show. We always joke that we're like uh, con- contractually obligated to talk about school choice every ten minutes on the show uh, because we work at TPPF. But we've never had our school choice advocate, our primary school choice advocate, Mandy. So we are very excited to have you here today. Give the people what they want. Absolutely. <laughs> um, all right. So a couple things. Uh, everybody knows I like to do a lot of uh, sh- uh, shameless plugs. Uh, first, of course, is for our our weekly newsletter, which is just absolutely fantastic. It's a whole collaboration of everything that we're doing at TPPF, uh, but also talks about the major issues of the day. So um, uh, we, we would love for everybody to sign up for that at texaspolicy.com slash the post. Uh, and I will also give a second plug to our website, which houses all of our uh, school choice uh, messaging, talking points, polling, all kinds of different things uh, at txparentsmatter.com, tx parentsmatter.com. Okay, Mandy, let's just jump right in. Um, I'm just, there's a hundred different things I want to ask you about, and, I'm, and we get a lot of feedback and a lot of questions and a lot of pushback, actually, on social media from various folks who are anti-school choice. So we want to answer all of those questions and, and bring up all those straw man arguments so that you can knock them down. Uh, but first, take us through kind of how we got to where we are now. School choice was one of the top two priorities for the governor, for, for uh, conservatives in the legislature. We got property tax done with two special sessions. Uh, School choice did not get done. ESAs did not get done. So to kind of tell us what all happened to kind of bring us to where we are right now. Sure. Well, public schools changed. That's what happened. You know, I was educated in a public school. I would imagine that most people watching or listening were educated in public schools. And there was a high focus on high quality curriculum and there was value alignment. And unfortunately, in the past decade or so, we've seen a total shift. And then when the COVID shutdowns happened and parents truly got a glimpse into the classroom, Mm -hmm. they realized, oh my goodness, this explains why my children are not reading on grade level. This explains why my child that just graduated from high school still lives in my basement. This explains why my children come back and are talking to me about things that are completely against the values that we are raising our children to believe. And when that happened, parents rose up. They rose up across the nation. They rose up in Texas and they said, you know what? It's time that we take back control. It's time that parents are the ones that are in charge of their child's education. And here we are. Mm -hmm. The largest grassroots momentum groundswell has coalesced together from all spectrum across Texas. Mm -hmm. North, south, east, west, rural, suburban, urban. And we have all said, you know what? Mm -hmm. To quote Governor Abbott, mom and dad are in charge. And this October, the governor's going to call the legislature mm-hmm. back and they're going to put parents back in charge. But, but politics and, and uh, government are a tricky thing uh, because it, d- despite all of that groundswell, despite all of that shift in perception and, and this really becoming a, pr- a parent driven movement. It didn't happen in the special in the in the regular session. There was a lot of talk. There were some there were some um, uh, meetings and or sorry committee meetings and, and obviously some legislation, um, uh, but it didn't happen then. So so you know what what do you think is is keeping that drive going and that motivation going uh, um, into the special session? Politics. This is all politics. Look, I can't tell you how many legislators on both sides of the aisle that I've had the blessing to sit down with or that others have sat down with and, and gotten the feedback. Look, we we know that this will benefit all of Texas. I'm talking all kids, including in the public school. We know this. Mm-hmm. But the politics comes into play. Look, one of the largest political players in Texas, well, it's a lot. It's a whole cabal of education profiteers, education unions. Let's talk about American Federation for Teachers. It is run by a lady out of New York called Randy Weingarten. You don't know who she is. I highly recommend you Google her for just quick. uh, Mike Pompeo, who used to run, was the secretary of state, called her the most dangerous woman in the entire world. Mm. Why? Because she is highly effective at messaging and lying to parents 
and foregoing and forsaking the responsibilities in our classroom. They are actively sending mailers out right here in Texas. Mm -hmm. They are actively pushing digital ads. They are actively funding entities all across our state to just put out propaganda. And that's what it is. We know, we saw um, last week, there was an article that came out that was talking about how the Democratic caucus met and they called out a bunch of their members who whispers were that they were gonna support empowering parents. Mm -hmm. Look, this is a nasty business. And the reality is the politics is what has kept parents from having the freedom to select the best school for their child. And and Derek, obviously, as a as a ledge watcher, uh, do you see things that, that you see things that are going to be different this time around? Well, yeah, I think that the governor basically summed it all up when he said, look, I can call unlimited overtimes on this particular game. <laughs> And, and I think that having that sole focus of, of education, freedom, of school choice during this special session, I think it'll m maybe clarify some of the, the visions and the uh, political incentives that are um, at stake. Because obviously, you know, we're well before the filing period for uh, primary opponents. He's made no bones about saying that uh, he will be active in such period if, uh, you know, if he needs to be. Um, mm -hmm. And I have no reason to believe that that's not the case. I think if you look... Uh, you know, Mandy brought up a good point with uh, Randy Weingarten. She was in the news just uh, recently in my home, old hometown of Toledo uh, protesting uh, with the UAW workers because, again, it, it's very interesting. Socialists going to be socialists, I guess. Uh, you know, birds of a feather. Uh, yeah, right. All but, but all that to say is, look, <clears throat> here you have somebody who rep who's purportedly represents the interests of teachers. Now, there was a whole bunch of funding that was actually earmarked for the classroom, for teachers, that ended up getting torpedoed because people didn't want to take a vote on any, even a modicum, of parental empowerment. Right. So that's one question I have for you, Mandy, is how do you explain, basically, if they want to say that, look, we represent teachers, they are actually motivating legislative maneuvering against teachers' interests. How do you square that? That's exactly what's happening, Derek. So let's let's talk about how the teachers are being used by superintendents and unions who are making half a million dollars. That's y'all. That's how much some of our superintendents here in Texas are Good making. Good work if you can get it. Right. <laughs> um, and when we talk about funding, when we adjust for inflation since 1970, our public education funding has increased by 166%. Where is it today? Well, the legislator, legislature just voted in an additional 10.3 billion, with a B, billion dollars to add on top of the 85 billion we spend right now. We're at over $16,000 per child. And, well, and that's the largest increase in the history of the largest state. Largest right? increase in the history of the state. No yeah. one's talking about this. It's amazing. Why are we not like having a ticker tape parade out in the streets? Yay, we're no, fully I'm, funding I'm, choice. I'm just seeing our parents. I'm seeing Democratic state members gearing up for this and using those talking points that, you know, we're underfunded or we're defunding or right. we're pulling funding out of schools. It's like, no, we spend eighty four <laughs> billion dollars a year on public schools and we just increased it by almost eleven billion dollars. That's right. And let's be clear. <laughs> Part of that money, all of us parent empowerment advocates that are, are advocating for teachers as well, because we know that parents and teachers are the number one indicator of a child's success. We want to pay teachers more. We advocated and pushed to have $4 billion sent to teachers. We want great teachers to be lifted up. We want to make sure we're supporting them. And what happened? Those unions and those anti-parent legislators that are afraid of all of these entities, that electioneer, mm -hmm. they said, no, we're not going to do that because there was also a provision in the legislation, this was HB 100, mm -hmm. to give parents choices as well. So they're making the choice that when it comes to what, what would you, you know, you, they say we're underfunded, they say we need more money, but they're willing to forego that money if... There's some modicum of choice or more control over a child's education in the bill. They well, must protect the precious. Well, that's what yeah. it is. Right. So there it's you not go. about it's, the money. It's, then. it's not about the money. Yeah. It's yeah. not about the money. It's about that control. 
And so as much as as much as we could sit here and talk about the politics, this yes. is the right idea. Yes. <laughs> so we need to talk about ideas. Um, but this is I think this is actually one of the more important um, a- aspects of this debate is what is the idea? What is the policy? Now, we don't have a piece of legislation sitting in front of us. And so things could change. Um, but what do you suspect uh, m- most likely would be the vehicle for school choice uh, in the special session? Great question. Education savings accounts is what the governor and so many leaders in the House and in the Senate and the lieutenant governor and the senators, Senator Cruz, Senator Horn, that's what they're all advocating for. Education savings accounts are really, really something that enables parents to customize their education. It's different than the um, old kind of, well, it's now been denigrated to a bad word, the vouchers or right. um, that were started, you know, 25 years, 30 years ago in Wisconsin, where you were handing kids the ability to go specifically to a private school. But where education savings accounts are so amazing is they're flexible. The money that is allocated, which is about $10,000, would mm-hmm. go into an account controlled or held, housed by the comptroller's office. Mm-hmm. And then parents Parents can direct that funding to whatever educational resources will best educate their child. So yes, it can be directed to an accredited private school for tuition. It can be used for tutoring and therapies. Mm -hmm. It can be used for extracurriculars or Mm co-curriculars. It can be used for transportation for a fee provider. It can be used for supplemental materials, educational resources. It is so flexible. And in the 21st century, that's what we should have. Mm -hmm. Parents should be the ultimate decision makers. And if their child needs extra tutoring or needs to go to a different school, we should be saying we encourage and support that. That is freedom. That is the foundation of America. Mm -hmm. That is what has made us great. And it is what will make our education system great as well. And you had dirt. Well, no, I was just going to ask. And and again, kind of pivoting back to the political point is that we see a lot of uh, AstroTurf activity on this, right? We see a lot of AstroTurf activity uh, that gets taken up by, I think this morning I saw um, a pretty, you know, ineffective backbencher uh, re- basically retweeting some of these uh, remarks. But essentially, they're trying to coalesce the or align these coalitions based on some form of you know, some form of, of, of common thing, whether it's, you know, religion and all that, you know, we saw out there, you know, again, I mentioned AstroTurf, so I got to shout out uh, Pastors for Texas Children. Um, <laughs> but you see them out there basically, again, obviously misleading with the whole voucher remark, mm-hmm. but also really taking some pretty, and I, and I dare say unchristian, uh, you know, accounts to defend the institution of public well, it's a public school districts, not not even public schools. And so that's one of the w- things that I don't understand where it's coming from. I understand, you know, the asset process. I understand all that stuff. But why specifically are we don't even have like a two order, a, a two order effect here? It's basically, you know, a place with, a, you know, actual teachers union uh, employees on its board and then taking, you know, the word of God to use to beat, beat up people that want to actually improve people's outcomes and maybe even see uh you know, I would say flourishing within private schools, but schools more generally. So charlatans have routinely Mm. used the word of God Mm. to try and distort his message, which is individual freedom, Mm -hmm. personal responsibility, and parental rights. And that's what these, like I said, charlatans that are funded again by these nefarious unions, by the way, are doing. They are taking the values that Texans hold dear and they are perverting them. Mm-hmm. And so that same group that you're talking about, they pa- posted something saying, well, Baptists don't support this. And I went there to sit there and I was like, Dr. Robert Jeffries just uh, it was on a call with the governor with faith leaders from across every demographic, every denomination They're saying, going to no we real support Baptist this, right? Yeah. And the same time I click on their little piddly website and I'm like, the first article I see is a question of, is Greta Thunberg, is that, yeah, whatever Greta, that, that girl, Greta. yeah, the yeah. Greta girl, could she be a prophet? Yeah. What? Yeah. It was bananas. So anyways, look, well, the and, left and, and, and Marxists have done a great job at co-opting the values that have made America great. The mm-hmm. love of country, 
faith and family and they've used our values against us and that's what they're doing so those groups those after church groups they're all charlatans it's nonsense <laughs> well uh, well Greta, saint greta that's a that's a new one on me we should have had her on we should have had her on for uh, the jason interview yeah for <laughs> sure uh, give us your commentary on energy as well <laughs> um you know what I, I do want to get back to you know the the difference between the esas and vouchers i mm. think you made a really good point uh there i think that's something that a lot of people don't understand because the media will use them interchangeably as though they're mm. the same thing and it's not. I mean, it's like calling baseball football. Okay, they're both sports. They have roughly the same people on the same, you know, on the on the field at the same time. But but they're completely different. They're they're completely two different things. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the the old voucher was you know was literally a block of money that went to a private school, and that was it. ESAs are much more flexible. It's funny. We have polling. We actually polled. Um, uh, as you know, we we polled uh, school choice opponents, right? People who said you know I don't support that. I you know support public schools or whatever. When you explain to them, when you actually give them the truth about what ESAs do, a third of school choice opponents actually support ESAs, uh, which is, of course, the thing, the, the vehicle that, that we'll be uh, debating um, next month. One of the, one of the, I think, to some degree, legitimate criticisms of ESAs. I mean, you talk about having this account, you're talking about this money. Immediately people think, oh, is this cash? You know, how does this work? What is somebody, you know, we, we see the, the problems with people using, you know, welfare money to go buy, you know, alcohol or cigarettes or something like that. Sure. Well, uh, there's uh, There's gotta be protections here, right? So what kind of accountability uh, or do mm. an oversight essentially will, will uh, the various entities have, TEA or the comptroller or whoever, to make sure that those money go to approved uh, uh, pr approved items? Great question. Okay, so let's start with the fact that 31 other states plus the District of Columbia have some form of private school choice. That's where money is allowed to be used at the parent's discretion. Some older systems are straight up vouchers. The new model of education savings accounts, because it provides that flexibility, has taken off like gangbusters. Look, we're seeing it's called universal school choice or universal education savings accounts mm -hmm. that we've seen in Florida and Arizona and Arkansas and Iowa and, and the list goes on and on and on because it puts money into an account. Now let's talk about that, not into a parent's personal bank account. We're not just throwing money into a personal bank account. This has been done and we've actually done it here in Texas. Listen, so we already have a program. We have that works. a program <laughs> here in Texas. And let me tell you how fantastic it's been. So when the schools shut down for COVID and some of our most vulnerable and disadvantaged students are special needs students, they were unable to get the services that they need mm -hmm. to keep progressing. Let's not even talk about how bad it was for so many kids learning virtually. Let's talk about these students that needed really specialized assistance mm -hmm. through an IEP or 504 or whatever it was. Okay, those kids, the governor in his wisdom said, wait a second, these kids are struggling and they're not getting help. He created a program called the SSES, mm -hmm. the Supplemental Special Education Services Program, and it gave $20 million to parents in the form of grants, mm -hmm. $1,500 grants for public school parents to go get the help that they needed, mm -hmm. that the public system was not providing. Y'all, it was wildly successful. It mm -hmm. took off January 11th. It was almost completely exhausted within about six weeks. And the legislature went, oh, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. This is no really surprise. important. Yeah. <laughs> Let's create a law and let's make sure that parents have this. So all of this, the there was there is a company, there are several companies, they are called education administration organizations. They partner with the comptroller's office to make sure money goes into the account and it is directed to approved goods, services, and or accredited schools. It's been successful. We've done research on it. It's oversubscribed. They've appropriated more money. It is so beneficial. And we and have no not found stories. any, we have yeah. not found one case. There are over 72,000 families that have had access to this form of school choice. Mm -hmm. And we have not found one case of fraud or abuse. Not one. Um, Derek? How am I supposed to follow that up? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, but I mean, you bring up you bring up a very good point. Uh, not only the need for the SSES, but just you know, just anecdotally, I can tell you, you know, I've heard nothing but positive things about it because it had that obviously a very pronounced need, a need that was being addressed by public schools. Because after all, we don't you know we don't hate public schools. Right. You know, we just think it could be more efficiently administered uh, in this particular way. And the parents loved it. The parents absolutely loved it. So that's one thing that I will draw an underline for. 
going back to or kind of on that point, one of the straw men that we see a lot out there is, oh, well, this is just, you know, you're trying to hasten in uh, the handmaid's tale so that people can take all these uh, all this public money and go to a, uh, you know, a private Catholic school or, or whatever the case might be. What do you how do you respond to that? Well, I mean, I, the money can be used I for get, public schools too, right? We, yes, I we mean, want, you didn't mention that earlier, but I wanted to bring that out. It's yeah, like if you want to just go to the public school that's across the district, you can do that with the money. Yes, they can. Mm. But right now, these boundaries are set. Did y'all know that some public school districts charge tuition? Mm-hmm. Right, I right found that out. south yeah. of Austin, Alamo Heights charges fourteen thousand dollars a year if you don't live within the government boundary line. So that's a great question, and that yes, we want them. Also, when we're talking about high schoolers. Look, this mentality that was created by the educrat, educrat bureaucracy, the profiteers of money that comes from taxpayers and parents, they created this slogan, right? College for all. Sounds great. Yay, let's all be educated. The problem is, is every kid doesn't want to go to college. They don't need to go to college. Look, in Texas alone, we have a shortage of 10,000 electricians by 2023, 4,500 HVAC workers, welders, plumbers, the list goes on and on. You know why? We do not incentivize schools or parents the ability to be able to say, hey, child, hey, son or daughter, you don't want to go to a four-year school? Cool. Why don't you go while you're in high school, finish your high school credits, because Let's be real. There's not a whole lot going on in that senior year of high school. <laughs> we got. It's been know, a while since uh, I was a senior in high school, well, but I, that's probably there's why. There's late the arrival and early dismissal <laughs> and one or two. Anyways, my point is, is we can get kids graduating high school and being certified to be plumbers or electricians. Kids should be leaving school if they don't want to go to college, if they don't want to take out massive debt and be able right. to enter the workforce. It's a win, win, win for everybody. And especially because those jobs are paying sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars, you know, right out of high school. I mean, some nineteen, eighteen, you know, twenty year old making seventy five thousand dollars and no debt. And I mean, no it's huge. Debt. By the way, I love the way you uh, talk to your kids. Hey, child, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that well, <laughs> with mine and see what well, happens. I, I, boys and girls, I'm not, I'm not picking one or the other, but I will be really honest on this we have a crisis for young men in this country Mm. it is a absolute crisis there are young men we have hundreds of thousands of them that are being left to flail they are being left behind because we are not acknowledging that boys and girls have different interests and aptitudes many boys want to go use their hands and work on cars or boats or welding or whatever it is Mm -hmm. and we keep trying to pretend like no you have to go to college you have to do this just to funnel more money into this educrat profiteer system absolutely the the other um issue and we i love bringing up the straw man because this is you know we we pull our hair out with these crazy arguments yes. every day um, the other one is uh, is on testing right is uh, like the educational standards as though the private schools somehow are getting away with not teaching these uh, these kids you know parents are spending ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars on private school educations but the but somehow the private schools are not actually teaching the kids um, and so there's this there's sort of this ridiculous not even straw man it's more of a ridiculous argument that the private schools aren't going to be uh, accountable for the quality <laughs> of the education um, that that they provide if, if if they're, if we're, you know, if kids decide to go there instead of the public schools, y- your thoughts on that? <laughs> Great. So let's be clear: <laughs> accredited private schools all take it's referred to as a norm reference test. There's a little less than a dozen of them. They're taken in Texas and all across the country. Y'all, these are the tests, like the MAP tests or things like that, that actually tell parents where their kids are. These are taking place in all of our accredited private schools. It's mm-hmm. part of the process of being accredited. Y'all, if parents are spending their own money, let me tie in another thing. The average private school in Texas costs about $9,300. Mm-hmm. The governor and I went to a school in Corsicana that operates H- on Humble clo- brag, by the way. Did you see how she did that? <laughs> <laughs> You know, just the governor and I just rolled in. Because he's been on a mission to educate families. He Mm -hmm. has led this mission. And we went to a school that operates off of, it's called a love offering. A love offering. The parents say, this is what we can afford. It's amazing. There's a school called the King's Academy that we went to in inner city Dallas a year ago. Mm -hmm. 100% scholarship, inner city, low income, primarily minority kids. Mm -hmm. Look. 
the reality is that parents are sacrificing because they want to make sure their child has the best opportunity yeah. at a strong future and to launch and be successful and happy in but life. In terms of the, the quality of the education, Derek, you know, one of the, 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 to me, the fatal conceit here on this whole, on that whole straw man argument is that if you, let's say you send your kid to private school until they're in third grade, mm -hmm. and then you decide you want to send them to the public school in fourth grade, they start in fourth grade because the public school recognizes and takes and, and officially uh, takes mm -hmm. all the credits that yep. they earned in those three years mm -hmm. over. They don't start back in second grade or, or whatever. They accept that they are that they're at a fourth grade level. They mm -hmm. wouldn't do that mm -hmm. if they thought that the, the that the education was was subpar, that they're not taking the right tests or whatever. Well, no, I want to I jump in on that because I think that you're you're approaching a very important topic and one that yeah, again when we see uh, less than truthful uh, admissions from from the other side on this is essentially that, oh, well, school choice doesn't work, right? Like, mm -hmm. so in other words, being able to diversify the suite of educational services that any given child has an ac access to is either a push or a net negative for uh, that child. How do you respond to that? Because that, I, I, mean, I don't even know how to phrase that into a, uh, a, point, a leading question because it's such a ridiculous statement. It is. I think it's well known and accepted that private schools tend to outperform or do outperform their public school counterparts. Let's get real. In fact, there was a recent study that found that if you if the Catholic education, if Catholic schools were their own state, they would rank number one in the country. In education. <laughs> in education. That's right. So, okay. So let's just get that out. Like the quiet part out loud, like, yeah, come on, y'all. Yeah, this, right. is, this is the reality. It's why people sacrifice to send their kids to schools because yeah. they want that high quality education. Let's also talk about the fact that TEA, Mike Morath, came out and said only 19% of the curriculum in our public schools are on grade level. That is a crisis of low expectations. So the kids, Not the performance, the curriculum. The so curriculum, 80, but, that, but that ties into the performance, and this is really, really well, important. Let me, just, let me just make sure everybody understands the problem. The, the materials that the kids are receiving, so the books and the lessons and all that kind of stuff, 80% of what they're being given by the, by the teachers is not, on, is, not up to career, or is not up to standard. That's correct. And then oftentimes it's dumbed down because there's, this, oh, they can't do it. That's why you see this argument over uh. accountability and we should factor in all these. We, uh, parents just want to know, can their kids read or mm. write? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fact. So, but, but let's look at those kids that are most disadvantaged. Let's just take a look at what's gone on around our country. I like to point to Florida for an example. Florida recently passed universal school choice. You can go wherever you want to go. But let's go back to the early 2000s. In 2002, the legislature passed private school choice specifically at that time for only low income kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. At that point, the NAEP scores that's kind of seen as the, the nation's report card. It's mm -hmm. where we compare how kids are doing all around the country. The NAEP score showed that Florida's low income demographic, their low income students ranked 33 in the nation, number 33. Private school choice passed. It was implemented in 2003. And by 2019, Florida's low income demographic ranked number one. It still holds the number one place in our country when adjusted for demographics. Over uh, uh, Massachusetts, Maryland, you can throw all these in. This works. Right. It, and it for gives, the public schools, it, it's not yes, just that's about. That's what them. I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. made the public schools do better. They started focusing, right. they started focusing on the basics and they started, they were incentivized mm -hmm. because they knew that a child could leave. And that's where you see the entire system Let's get follow better. follow up on that and then I'll get to your point, Derek. The, the, the interesting stat that I heard just to wrap that up the other day is among the 100 top ranked U.S. News and World Report, top ranked public schools, if you count them all up, the state with the most schools on there is Arizona. That's right. Which has universal school choice. That's Number right. Number two is Florida. That's right. Which has universal school choice. So whatever you say about you know what it does to public schools, whether it makes them better or you know whatever it is, you're cherry picking, whatever. 
The fact is, it certainly doesn't destroy the public school no. system. No. The best schools in the country are in places like Arizona. Public, best public schools in the country are in places like Arizona and and, and Florida That's that right. have universal school choice. Sorry. That's right. There. And and so just re, re, you know again revisiting the the coalitional aspect. I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm drilling down on this, but it's like we have you know we at TPPF have been you know, school choice advocates since 1989. You know, many of many of my policy staff uh, are not as old as our campaign to to uh, increase uh, school choice. What? I don't know, what? I don't know if, that's a, if that's a good thing or a bad <laughs> stat to use, but yeah. we're, we're, we're finally there. We're so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but persevere, that's ladies right. and gentlemen. There you go. Persevere. Perseverance in the race Vigilance. of life. I don't know what you're talking about. It was freedom. actually just a compliment to how uh, the quality of our uh, of our uh, staff. Well, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, finally, we got the right yeah, staff. Comms guy, that's blocking bridging. Come on. <laughs> so, no, no. But, but what reason I want to ask, though, is, again, if it's taken so long here in Texas... But, you know, in Florida, it went, you know, I'm not saying that it was an easy lift in any of these states that it went through, but it taken so long here in Texas, you know, Florida, universal, Arizona, universal, uh, Iowa would like to put a pin in Iowa. Um, I, Iowa is, you know, went a, a very aggressive uh, school choice route. What's, you know, what's the difference between Texas and all these other states, um, you know, that have pre-existed? So there's a couple things. Number one. We have over 1,200 school districts. That means we have over 1,200 public school superintendents, assistant superintendents, other administrative bloat that they waste money on. I, mm. but, but those people want to maintain that control. So that's number one. Number two, we're Texas. We are the leaders in this mm -hmm. country. And let me tell you, the rest of the country, the union leaders in the rest of the country know that. Mm -hmm. And they spend massive amounts of money and power to try and push propaganda down into our communities. Mm -hmm. Millions, tens of millions of dollars have been spent to lie to Texas parents and teachers. And that's where for 30 years... We have tried to educate, but we are fighting a moral battle. We are fighting for the freedom and the future of Texas and of our entire nation. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't looked around to see what's going on with young people who are lost, they spend their times as keyboard warriors and living in their mommy's basement and protesting or breaking, as opposed to actually fulfilling the life that every parent envisions for their child. Yeah. Look, we are fighting for that. And as goes Texas, so goes the rest of the country. So we are fighting against entities from across the nation. But now Texans realize this is the path forward. Education freedom is truly a rising tide that will lift all boats. And we need that. Because another thing I want to point out here is, look, Texas is growing. Business is booming. We are the ninth largest economy in the entire world, y'all. So we see all these people coming in. Here's the thing. Texans are behind from our counterparts, our, the Americans that are moving in. Recent data just showed that those that are moving from out of Texas into Texas have two times as many post-secondary degrees and certifications. That means they're taking jobs away from my kids and yours. Yeah. If we don't fight to make sure our kids are on solid ground and well educated, those kids are getting better education really in other states, and then coming here. It is, here and, and then, then they come here because <clears throat> we have great policies because we do support freedom, mm -hmm. but we cannot continue to let our own children suffer. Yeah. Well, I want to get um, shifting gears just a little bit. You started to mention I want to get to the funding issues as well, um, because there's a lot of misinformation and misleading information about there about how much we spend money on. Now, I don't want to get into a debate about whether we should spend more, whether we should spend less or whether we should spend the right amount, mm -hmm. um, you know, or what's funded or underfunded. I just want to get to the facts. I just want to get to like, what is the what are the actual numbers say? And we get this information from TEA, the Texas Education Agency, which tracks all of this. Now, the one number that's out there that's always being pushed by the left uh, to demonstrate that we don't you know give enough money to, to kids is is six that was that we only spend six thousand dollars per kid uh, in public schools uh, and that that puts us in the bottom ten of all public education spending I'm assuming that's not correct <laughs> that is so <laughs> a fabricated number that is so <laughs> not correct let me just give you an analogy that would be like going in, to a restaurant and ordering a hamburger and then bringing out a raw patty and being like 
there's your hamburger. Yeah, this is all we pay for. This is all it is. Like, come on. That's the basic allotment number. That is a number that we start with. And then we start saying, okay, let's add in rural district weight. They're weight. They're called weights. It's it's additional money, y'all. That's what it is. Let's add in rural district. Let's add in midsize. Let's add in low income. Let's add in special needs. Let's add in this. Let's add in that. Let's add in da 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 And where do we come what does our burger look like when it's been cooked and has ketchup and mustard and blue cheese, if you're me, and what do you, whatever on it? What does it look you're like? You're customizing it's your hamburger. It's a sixteen thousand dollar hamburger, y'all. I mean, that's that's what we're doing here. Or, or what? I saw somewhere in New York put like gold flakes or something on it, and and it was like a five hundred dollar. We're not going to let you get away with the blue Anyways. cheese stuff, though. I mean, are, are we, oh, it's you're so really going to stand for this, Brian? <laughs> It's so good. Not stand for blue cheese. No beans um, in our chili. No my, blue cheese in our hamburgers. <laughs> but my point New is Oppo just drop. Yeah. that <laughs> that number again. It's part of the deception. Yeah. It's part of the lie. So in the uh, so TEA has a very you know easy to use website. You can find uh, the yes, information. I link so to easy. it all the time. Like right. here it is. So, Here's the number. So that's the number. Is, is it's over sixteen thousand. So they're literally leaving out more than half of all the money that we spend on public education and using that six thousand dollars number. And even well, if and even if you take out buildings, right, like facilities and things like that. Okay, that's not in the classroom. You still get to twelve thousand. So you're still talking about the numbers actually double what they're claiming. Uh, that it is, and of course, all of that information is available on TEA. Now, whether it should be twenty thousand or fifty thousand or whatever, we can have that debate over that. And that, and then, very, and frankly, we want to have that debate because that's about what do we spend the money on, which you- which is, of course, one of the debates they don't want to have because because to your point, there's all this administrative bloat. Um, and one of the things on that I wanted to mention earlier was that there actually was an amendment because we know that there was an amendment during the regular session to require half of all of the new money to be put into schools, whatever that means, into the classroom, mm. essentially, to require half of all of this money, because that's one of the things that they say uh, we don't spend enough money on. Guess who voted against that amendment to require half of all spending? All of the people that oppose school choice. So, uh, so again, one, again, another point about it's not the money. <clears throat> No, and let me be clear when we talk about that. That gives opposition to parental empowerment the narrative that they need. Oh, those people don't, they just don't want to give teachers pay raises. Y'all, we're building $35 million football stadiums. I love Friday nights. I can't wait to go tailgate tonight with the governor sharing the good news about education savings accounts. But let's be clear. If you are in a district where over half the kids cannot read and write on grade level, and that is your priority, Mm -hmm. you've got your priorities wrong. If you are in a distant district that is building a water park Mm -hmm. on your school property, La Jolla ISD, I'm looking at you, that is a problem. (laughs) You say it three more times, uh, Quintero is actually going to appear. (laughs) Palestine ISD, let's get real. They've built, they won't tell me because we've PIR'd it. We've we've asked for them to turn over all their records. They won't tell me how much they just spent. It's somewhere between five and 20 million while at the same time telling their teachers we're sorry we can't give you a pay raise look it perpetuates a narrative that that the unions and these leaders that want to maintain their control it keeps them saying oh teachers we can't pay you more while at the same time funneling money in the back door to education profiteers that take our tax dollars and do not care if my child or your child or your child actually gets the education that they deserve yeah i was gonna say 35 million sounds like a a deal for a stadium prosper (laughs) isd is gonna have a a a, a Mm -hmm. bond for 94 million dollar stadium 94 million dollars now Prosper, you look it up, their kids are getting educated, it's fine, whatever. But still, don't, I mean, you're going to build a $94 million stadium and that's where we're going to be spending education dollars. Right, and let me, let me be clear about what happens. I don't, uh, look, 31 other states have this. The highest take-up rate in the entire country, take-up rate is how the percentage of parents that say, you know, I need something else. Mm-hmm. I need something else else for my child for one reason or another it's five and a half percent it's in new hampshire that's it it's not there's not some mass exodus we're not destroying a system and let me talk about who these parents are let me talk about christy from conroe who came up to me crying because her special needs child had been abused and the system is actually having to pay for her to her child to go to a private school because they failed him. She cannot talk about it 
mm-hmm. because she was put under a non-disclosure agreement and they will not give her child the services they need. Let me talk about a mom, I won't use her name, from, I'm going to say, Jadine's district, who reached out and said, my daughter was a swimming star at the high school here. She had a phenomenal career in education and athletics at the public high school. I love the public school. She said, my son has Asperger's. He was bullied to the point of hanging himself. And I showed up at the hospital where obviously they had gotten the neck out. He survived because her husband found him. And I had to, I had the resources to put him in another school, but a lot of kids don't. These stories are real. Mm -hmm. These parents that need something else, whether it's because their child is bullied, not getting the services they need. These are real, and that is who we fight for. And that is, I mean, and those two stories are, are particularly tragic um, um, because of their outcomes. But but every child that is not getting getting the services that That's they right. need from the from any education system, um, it, that that is also tragic. Um, and and then to your point, and one thing I want to bring up later is that you know not you know especially parents with multiple children, it, it, the, most of them want to send their child to That's the local right. public school. That's where the activities happen that's where their friends are and all of that but maybe one of the kids just doesn't it doesn't click for them and they and they need to have either special needs or special kind of attention or tutoring uh, or some kind of different kinds of materials and things like that and they should have the opportunity to use the resources that are being already being spent on them for the thing that will actually get them um, their uh, the most important or to get them the best education possible Um, well we're we're coming to the end of the show Um, anything else you want to hit Derek uh, before I move on to the the I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure people can get involved because yes. obviously you know you're very passionate about this we at TPBF have been working on this for 35 years well, uh, just really quick before um, again because uh, it seems like all my line of questioning has been focused more on the uh, political side of the equation it's the fun part it's yeah. for sure oh, definitely. <laughs> so I mean, it, it's no it's no secret if you look out there that this I mean start from the start of this year all the way through I mean even before but you know, Governor Abbott has put this issue on his back and is hard charging on it. I, I, I think that's probably an understatement even. Um, that being said, it, you know, what do you suppose it kind of led to this? And, and, and again, you know, we, the fact that people are, are very passionate about this issue now, uh, obviously we can attribute some to COVID, right? But like the... It, it's almost like the, 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 the political landscape has shifted so much so that, you know, this is the uh, in vogue thing to uh, advocate for, for for an elected official. What do you suppose that that macro I- issue that changed was? And again, again, I, obviously, COVID's one of them, but I don't think that COVID alone can explain the building of the groundswell, if that makes sense. It is. So to talk about Governor Abbott, he has been a warrior for parents and for Texans and for teachers. That's what he's doing. He is out, you know, I I have so many people say, wow, I've never seen him this passionate. Look, Mm -hmm. he is fighting for the future of Texas, like Mm -hmm. all of us. There is, he tells, he talks about Duncanville High School and playing football and his love of public schools and that he wants to continue to support them and continue to support teachers. But we cannot ignore that there are parents that need something else. Mm -hmm. And to the political part of it, one, it's just good for kids. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking, when you're shutting out all the noise of Mm -hmm. the unions and things like that, This is what's best for kids. Mm -hmm. And when you let parents be in charge of their child's education, parents become single issue voters. Mm. And let me give you an example of that. (laughs) Parents are single issue voters. We do not care. I mean, of course we care about other things, but we don't care about anything more than our own children. Mm -hmm. Look, I love my child more than anybody in this room, anybody watching, anybody in this world. And that would die for them. Something happened the first moment I held my baby. Mm -hmm. And every parent has that. And they know that. And they become single issue voters. So let me go back to Florida once again. Look, when Governor DeSantis was running in Florida, school choice had been there. It was there. 
It was there and it was supporting kids, particularly the low income and minority students. They, when he was campaigning, his opposition for governor said, I'm going to latch arms with the unions and I'm going to take away those scholarships. I'm going to take away education scholarships. And the mama bears, specifically low income minority mama bears, found out that this Democrat was going to take away their ability to send their child to a school that would ensure that their kid was successful as opposed to ended up on the streets or in prison because that's what was happening. These mama bears, and I met with many of them because I was a part of this, they said, I have a fifth grade education, but my child is going to do better. Mm -hmm. And you know what they did? Elected Ron 40,000 <laughs> of them switched parties and voted to elect Ron DeSantis. Those moms were single issue voters. And I'm telling you right now, the people in Texas, the parents, the grandparents that support freedom and want the best for their own individual child, they are single issue voters. Well, and that's going to be the change. Well, here. I mean, ob obviously, you know, in Florida, which is a, uh, let's say, redder shade of purple. You know, the same exact thing happened in Virginia, which is definitely a bluer yeah. shade of purple if we're going to go if we're going to yeah, call it purple. That's yeah. right. And and so it, it it's almost like locking arms with the union specifically because that's what McAuliffe did. It, it's politically suicidal. Mm -hmm. Yet we <clears throat> see it happen. Like why is that? One of the things I th I think I'm hearing from from Greg Ad, which is different this time, uh, which I think is what's it, which is which is what's creating all this frustration with the political class and with the folks who've been in control of this for so long. Is look, you know, when it comes to the legislature, it's just about giving us money, right? Like it's just about what are you going to do with the money? And you know, maybe conservatives say you should do this with it more, and this is a better way to do it. But usually, it's just about the money. It's all about you know how much money can we get into the system this time greg abbott is saying we are not going to leave parents out this time that's right there's going to be a discussion over money we've talked about it the 10.8 billion <clears throat> four billion of that still needs to be allocated um, and they would love to go into the special session and just talk about where the four billion is going to go that's and right. greg abbott is saying no we are going to include parents this time parents are going to get something out of this when we do education reform it's not just about taking dollars and, and funneling it into the system parents no parent left behind this time instead of no no child left behind that's right uh, but uh, speaking of behind we're, we're getting behind <laughs> on some of our but this is the school choice show and this is the you know this is the one that we, we definitely can invest the most time in the last thing I want to do is if you have any you know advice for folks if they want to mm -hmm. get involved uh, during the special session and what they can do if there's any events or any things that are coming up that, that we need to promote uh, to get people to go to I know the governor is going to be on a tailgate tour and that's those kinds right. of things so how can people get involved in you know f either getting out and about or even just from their couch or their computer, how can they how can they support this? Sure. So txparentsmatter.com. That's txparentsmatter.com. And you can go to the take action button and you just enter in your address. We don't keep the information, but it tells you it's just a finder and it tells you who your legislators are, your senator and your state rep. And you can go there and you can Click on it and it automatically brings up information and a teed up email, tweet, or phone number. Mm -hmm. All of that is there to make it easy. Mm -hmm. And they do listen. You asked why we're here. We're, we're here because the governor is leading this mission to empower parents. And we're here because parents are calling and emailing and saying, Representative so-and-so, stand with me. Mm -hmm. I can love and support my public schools and I can love and support each individual child and want their parents to be in charge. Mm -hmm. It's not this, this narrative that you can only do one or the other. Look, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. We can give the largest education funding increase in the entire state yep. history. And we can say parents should also be the decision makers and have access to education savings accounts. So txparentsmatter.com, take action. There's also lots of information there about all the accountability mechanisms, the legal protections for parents in private schools. How does this impact them? What does that look like? Um, what are public school options? How are, you know, magnet schools and charter schools and what's going on there? All that information is there. Then we're continuing the Friday Night Lights events. We are headed tonight. I'm about to hit the road to Dallas. We're so excited. We're going to First Baptist Academy there in Dallas. They're playing um, 
Mercy Culture Prep out of Fort Worth. It's going to be a phenomenal event. The governor's going to meet everybody. We're tailgating. He's flipping the coin and crowning the homecoming queen. And it's just going to be a big <laughs> deal. We're going to celebrate the fact that here in Texas, Friday Night Lights is a part of our culture and we love it. And if that's at an awesome public school in Duncanville or Conroe or McAllen or wherever, fantastic. If that's at a private school at any of those, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Parents know best. Yeah. Get involved. Call your legislator and together we'll put Texas on a path to not only be the freest and the most prosperous, but will be the best educated state in the union. That's another one of my favorite fun stats is uh, um, we look at the top 50 best high school uh, football teams in the country as ranked by High School America. Yeah. 34 of the top 50 are in school choice, school choice states. So school choice does not ruin football nope. as, we've, as we've talked about <laughs> in the past. Um, well, this has been fantastic. I'm sure we, we there's there's literally two or three other huge big questions about homeschool and all that other uh, <clears throat> stuff that we could have, have gotten into, but we are getting short on time. So thank you, Mandy, so much for being here. Of course, if, if folks out there still have questions, you can get in touch with me or with, I'm, I'm not sure if you're on social media or Twitter. Um, I'm not. I have... <laughs> yeah, avoid all that. You're a good example to your kids, that's for sure, for doing that. But uh, but Derek and I, unfortunately, are, are on there. And so you can find us at uh, Real B Phil and, and Cohen at TPPF uh, on, on X or Twitter or wherever the hell it's being called these days. <laughs> um, you can find us there. If you have more questions on this, of course, our website uh, is a good place for that. Um, you, I mean, it, all that information and research is all there and we're constantly and we're going to be you know a big push so if you follow our various social media channels you'll see all that information um, and if you have any other questions please we're happy to answer that we probably have one pages for literally everything that comes everything. up <laughs> uh, so we really appreciate it Manny thank you for being with us thank today you for me. and as always uh, thank you for listening thank you for watching we love your feedback hope to hear from you soon and as I always like to say do good and suffer the consequences we'll see you next time